Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, we're looking from the book of Matthew chapter 6, and we're looking at the scripture that a lot of people know as the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And we're looking at the second sentence of that prayer. And the second sentence of that prayer reads to us, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Another way of saying it would be your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That first word is referring to our heavenly father, that his will would be done, that his kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. As we look at the world around us, let's ask ourselves, what does God's kingdom look like? What would, he, what would the word kingdom even mean to us? When we think of the word kingdom, we think of the old medieval kings of Europe and how they lived and how they conquered and how they fought and what that looked like. Ancient kings of Persia and Greece fought over territory, fought for uh, the resources of the world and the uh, ability to say they were kings over vast empires. And people have fought and died for those empires by the hundreds of thousands over the centuries. But that's not the kind of kingdom that this word is referring to. What we think about when we think about God's kingdom is the person who was teaching the prayer. The person teaching this prayer was the smartest man who ever lived and the very best of heaven expressed to us equally. And in the mystery of the incarnation, equally human and equally divine. Jesus was teaching this prayer, and he was asking us to pray this prayer along with him. That the kingdom, the, the way that God looks at the world, would be expressed. So when you think of the word kingdom, think of the word reality for just a moment. And ask yourself, what makes your reality what it is? Say, well, I'm living here in the United States of America. That's a big part of my reality. I go to my job or I have a spouse or I have a home. That's my reality. That's where I live and that's what I do. And these are my family members. That's my reality. And, and all of that's true. But when you think of the word reality, I want you to think of a bigger picture. On uh, Mars this week, there was a... Uh, a little helicopter that took off. I don't know if you've watched this or not. But we have, we have a, a tiny little four-pound helicopter on Mars. And we think it's so cool that it takes off from that little platform and flies around Mars. It went 464 feet this week. <laughs> and we're able to look through the lens of a camera and see the two color pictures and the 50 black and white pictures that, that little helicopter took as it flew over Mars this week. And think to ourselves, what an amazing reality we live in. What an amazing universe we live in. To think of all the things that we're capable of doing here and creating all the things that we create here, and then to be able to have the technology to send something to Mars and fly that little four pound helicopter around Mars and and take pictures of that reality and, and think about this universe that God has created for us. That we don't just live in our own senses. We don't just live in our own perceptions. We don't just live in our own abilities to see the world around us. We literally live in God's reality that he created for us to experience and to know and to be blessed by. And that when we begin to think about God's kingdom, we're not just thinking about a king and, and knights and nobles and, and resources and warfare. 
we're thinking about God's reality and what he wants to see accomplished in this world. One of the things that has been the most difficult over this past year is shaping what is a person of God's response to the world around us. How do we respond to what's going on politically? How do we respond to what's going on with the pandemic? How do we respond to what's going on with the racial inequality that we see expressed in our culture? How do we react as Christians to what we are experiencing in the reality of the world that we live in that is not God's reality? And how do we tell the difference on where God wants us to live in his kingdom and where the world is calling us to live in their kingdom and in their reality. Because there's really a struggle going on between the forces of darkness and the forces of light, between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And we're caught in the middle of those two realities and we're trying to live in such a way that we want to live where God wants us to live and do the things that God wants us to do. If I were standing here today and I was an atheist and I said, I don't believe in God. By the way, I've always said I'm one God away from an atheist. I am. I'm one God away from an atheist. But what if I said I didn't believe in God, I didn't think God was real, and I thought everything about God's kingdom was totally false? How would you respond to me? when I called into question your deepest beliefs and your deepest thoughts and your deepest doubts and your deepest fears. And I explained to you why none of it was true and it was all a lie. How would you think about me? How would you treat me? Would you treat me with disdain? Would you treat me like I was silly and stupid and didn't know what I was talking about? Or would you get up and read that great proverb that says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, and you're a fool. <laughs> and I would hope that at Hope Church, that as we live in God's kingdom, we would learn how to treat each other like Jesus taught us to treat each other, with love and with kindness and with generosity and with grace so that they would say about the members and regular attenders of Hope Church that there's a place where even if you're different, they love you anyway. Even if you say you don't even believe in God, they still reach out to you with the right hand of fellowship and say, that's okay. Come walk with us and see how things are going in our lives and how our faith informs our reality. People don't need to hear how right we are. They don't need to be proven wrong in an argument or a debate. Jesus said to love your enemies, to rejoice. In Matthew chapter 5, the chapter before this one, he says, rejoice and be exceeding glad when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. When you go through battles and trials, ask yourself, how is God shaping my reality today and his, his kingdom that Jesus established and, 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 and talked to us about with his own life on the cross as the New Testament of God's grace? as the Old Testament became fulfilled and all the laws and the prophets became fulfilled in Jesus. Think about who we are today and what that's supposed to look like as we live in our reality. How kind have we been to each other on Facebook this week and this past year on our differences politically? Has there been a sense of grace and kindness that's overshadowed our political conversation as Christians this past year? I would have to say that if the world was looking at the church for grace and kindness in our political discourse this past year, they would probably have to look somewhere else. I'm just going to let that sit there for a minute. Because if we're supposed to be the people of God and we're supposed to be seasoned with grace and that our conversation as people of God is supposed to be living in God's kingdom and in God's reality, have the conversations we've been having Meet that standard of who God wants us to be and the reality that we're supposed to be living in. It's a simple question. It's not a political question. It's a spiritual question about really meaning what we pray when we say, your kingdom come. 
What does that look like? What does the reality that God wants us to live in look like? And how can we make a difference in the conversation we're having as a culture and as a country? This past week, I flew to Colorado. And uh, I had the privilege of standing there in that cemetery as my friend was put into the grave. And he'd served in the military, and when they brought out the flag and they stretched that flag out in front of that uh, casket there, and uh, I had never seen this read out loud at a funeral like this. But uh, the veteran who was there along with the honor guard to honor this man's service to our country, they stretched out that flag and then they began to fold the flag. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are 13 folds in our flag when it's completely folded. And the last flag, the last part of the flag that comes over the, the triangle shape and the, and the stars that are there, those blue stars. But what they did that I thought was significant was they began to read the 13 statements of what each one of those folds in that flag means. I don't know if you've ever heard that read out loud and watched those two soldiers as they fold that fold tightly and evenly and neatly and wait till the next statement is read. But it's an amazing statement of faith, of hope for the future, of blessing over our parents and our moms and dads who send their young children into war. It's an amazing statement of who we are as a country, what we believe and what we stand for. I'm not going to read all 13 of those today, but I encourage you to go home and read those and ask yourself, if we lived in that reality, what kind of a country would we live in? To think about the principles that we were founded on means that we want to think about what it means to live with God's blessing over our lives. To live in a country where the best of what it means that in God we trust is truly lived out from day to day in our political discourse, in our conversations with each other, and out of respect for those who've paid so much for the price of freedom that we celebrate here today. And I don't want to mix patriotism with spiritual walking before God, but I think they can exist together in a country that stands for what is right. And I believe that in so many ways our country is a beacon for hope and freedom to the world. All the much more the effect of our conversations have and the political discourse that we have matters not just to us, but to the world. Do you know what one of my favorite statistics is? And this is just to lighten the mood a little bit. One of my favorite statistics is that there are 335 million Americans approximately, and there are over 1.4 billion Chinese. That's not my favorite statistic. This is my favorite statistic. We still outweigh them. (laughs) Good news! (laughs) I'm like four Chinese myself. Now, I say that to put things in perspective for us, to help us think, not to browbeat us and not to think, make us feel bad about anything, but to say, we can do so much better if we live in God's kingdom and not the world's kingdom. We can do so much better in how we talk to each other and how we love each other if we recognize Jesus is teaching us to pray, God's kingdom come. Because the second part of that has to do with God's will being done. And when I think about God's will for us, and I think about the reality that God wants to live in, 
wants us to live in, I think about the relationship that God wants to have with us. So we would know what God's will was. We wouldn't be confused about what we were supposed to be doing. We would know what we're supposed to be doing because God's will is being done in our lives. And what does his will look like? What does his will feel like? How do we understand his will and live that out? We live it out in kindness and grace. We live it out in how we love each other. The relationship that we have with God should be one of our number one priorities. You should wake up every morning instead of saying, good Lord, it's morning. Say, good morning, Lord. <laughs> have a smile on your face when you wake up. I know some of you are going, yeah, I woke up and I just, ooh. you know, it's okay. Get loosened up, do a few exercises, get yourself going. Say, thank you, Lord, that I'm living in your reality this morning, that I woke up with your, with your smile of approval on me, and I can get up, and I can have some good things that I can do today. I can make a difference in the world, and I can live in your will today. God, help me to live in that relationship with you today where I can know that I'm doing what's right and living the way you want me to live. I don't have to worry about what anybody, what anybody else does. All I have to do is worry about what I'm doing and what God's calling me to do. I don't have to live in your life. I don't have to live in your shoes. I got to live in my shoes and live in your will today. So God, help me to live in relationship with you today and may your will be done through my life today. May your will be accomplished in my life today. May I live that out for you, Lord, so that your will would be done. And then the last part of this sentence talks to us not just about reality and relationship, but talks to us about reward. And I believe that God's blessing is on us as the people of God, as we live in his will. His blessing just saturates everything around us. I was... Uh, in Colorado, enjoying a couple of beautiful days. They told me I brought the California weather with me. I came in on Sunday. We landed the plane. It was 82 degrees in Denver. Monday, 80 degrees. Beautiful. Everybody was shaking their head. We were standing out there at the cemetery, and everybody was just shaking their head how beautiful it was. Tuesday, we got up, and there were some clouds in the sky, and they were some big Colorado clouds. And they were come sweeping across that plane, and all of a sudden, it started getting darker because the clouds covered the sun and all of a sudden it started raining and all of a sudden it started hailing and on my way to the airport on Tuesday I was driving through a hailstorm that was so loud on the top of the truck you couldn't hear yourself talk and there was five inches of hail on the ground and it looked like snow I've got video on my phone if you don't believe me it's crazy we went from 80 degrees the day before to five inches of hail on the ground and it coming down so hard you couldn't even... We were driving like six to ten miles an hour on Interstate 76 down into Denver. It was absolutely crazy. <laughs> and I thought about how quickly the circumstances around us can change. How quickly we can go from 80 degree weather to five inches of hail on the ground in our lives, so to speak. One visit to the doctor and all of a sudden your reality and, and your relationship with God is in, it's in flux because you're concerned and worried about all the things that are happening in your life and you're looking at all the different problems that you're dealing with and all of a sudden now everything's, what in the world, God? How, how's, how come this is happening to me? This is the same farmer friend last year that I was telling you about that got completely hailed out. Fortunately, his wheat hasn't budded out yet. And so it's just going to be fine with all of this hail in the water and everything. It's going to work out all right for him. But he told me, he said, right about this time, he said, if it gets too cold, and if the wheat buds out and then it gets too cold, he said, about, in about two weeks, this wheat's all going to be budded out. It's going to have all those potential seeds inside each one of those little kernels. He said, if it gets too cold and it freezes, 
The wheat will continue to grow, but there won't be any seeds that form inside those kernels. And he said, I'll go to harvest, and I won't have anything to harvest because there won't be anything inside that wheat. It will look perfect. It'll look like I should be getting 60 bushels an acre. And he said, I won't get hardly anything because that plant froze at the wrong time. Being a dryland farmer takes a lot of faith, I'll tell you, up there in northeastern Colorado. But I said, oh, there's a spiritual lesson in that for me. I told him that when he said that. And that is, God, help my heart not to get frozen. Because I'm going to look great to everybody else. But my Heavenly Father is going to know where my heart is, and He's going to know there's nothing in there. It's just an empty husk where the fruit of the Spirit of love and joy and peace should be. God, help my heart to be in that relationship with You so that when it comes to how I'm living here on earth, that Your kingdom would come and Your will would be done in me right here on earth, right now, right here. We're not praying that our that God's kingdom would come and His will would be done at some future point in time. Ten years down the road, yes, God, Your kingdom can come, but right now we're going to live like the devil. No, that's not how the prayer goes. Your kingdom come right here on earth as it is in heaven. The reward of my farmer friend is going to be when he goes out in that field in about a month and a half and he begins to harvest. And he begins to see all that chaff being blown away and all that beautiful wheat seed being blown into the back of that combine. And all the hard work he's put in and all the plans that he's had and the perfect system that God has created for that wheat to grow and to be harvested, he'll finally see the harvest. Three or four of those seeds that we mailed back to him have been planted in a field right next to his house and every day he goes out and he looks at those seeds and uh, he walked down into the fields with me this week and he showed me right where he planted those four seeds we sent him back from a harvest that had failed last year. I was looking at thousands of acres of wheat and I was stepping like this over the rows because I didn't want to step on even one plant. (laughs) He said, don't worry about it, it'll grow back. I said, well, it won't. I don't want to give it any excuse not to, so I'm not going to step on it. (laughs) And I thought about the rewards that we get and the rewards that we have as we live out God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Because in, in spite of what we may be dealing with physically this morning, whatever you may be going through in your body or or anything that may be happening to you, you are living in God's reality. You are living in relationship with God and He is preparing a place for you so that when He comes again, He may receive you unto Himself that where He is, there you may be also. We're looking at the reward of being a part of God's kingdom this morning and the freedom that we have to follow through on those decisions that we make to surrender our lives to God and recognize who He is and how He wants us to live. In spite of the storms of life, in spite of how fast your circumstances might change, in spite of sometimes you may be getting your harvest completely hailed out, God is the Lord of the harvest. He's in charge of the future. He's in charge of what's going to happen. And He knows all about it. God's not intimidated by who's running the House of Representatives this morning. He's still on the throne of the Senate of the United States of America, and his presence still overshadows the White House of this great country. Do not be disturbed by what's going on in the reality of this world and in the things that would not measure up to who God wants us to be and how God wants us to live. Live towards the horizon of the eternity that God has created for us and that he wants us to live in and get a view of heaven and not a view of the things on this earth. Put your minds on things above. Now I know we have a country that's broken. We all know that because we're broken. We live in a broken world because there are a lot of broken people living in this world. But I'm praying with you that God's kingdom would come, that his will would be done right here at Hope Church and right here in Vista as it is in heaven. And I'm looking towards what that prayer means and living that out in my life this week with you. So as we close our service today, I'd like for Lester, if he would, to come back.
And Lester, let's just, uh, okay. Yeah. Lester, I'm going to just ask if that uh, you would play the song that you were uh, playing just a, a moment ago, uh, Change My Heart, O God. And uh, as we sing that together, let's sing it as a prayer that God would change our hearts, that God would change how we're thinking about life, that, that this would be a prayer that we would mean, that maybe your conversation next week on social media might change a little bit, might be tempered with a little bit more grace, a little bit more love, maybe even a little bit more kindness, that people would look at the church and say, you know, we don't always agree with where they stand politically, but they sure do love us in spite of it. <laughs> Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Let's sing that as our prayer this morning. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. As we pray together, I would like for us to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6 in its entirety. For those of you joining us online, Let's pray that prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless each one of you. Have a great week.